Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 1. We have a lot of ground to cover, so we'll start there. Isaiah chapter 1. You there? Yes. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our Elohim, you people of Gomorrah. The word translated law there is Torah, and Torah means the teaching or the instruction. So Isaiah says, give ear unto the instruction of our Elohim. So Torah is not just instruction, and it's not instruction from Moses. It is the instruction of our Elohim. And look at the first part of verse 10. He says, hear the word of Yahweh. So it is the very word of Yahweh. Torah is Yahweh's word instructing us. It's, it's not writings that contain some of his words. It in its entirety is the word of Yahweh. It is his instruction, his teaching, and it's written in a book. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says this. This book of Torah, this book of the law, King James, this book of Torah shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So this book is a book of instruction spoken by Yahweh himself, and it has information that Yahweh wants to impart to us so that we can have good success. Good success, if you look that word up, the word translated good success actually means to think or be intelligent. We would say it this way, you will be made to understand. Yahweh wants us to meditate on Torah, his instruction, so that we can be made to understand. Or we could say it this way, you will be instructed properly or you will be taught properly. Uh, we've used this quote before, but it fits here again. Ronald Reagan once said this. He said, the trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Well, that's the point that Yahweh is making in his instruction to, to uh, Joshua. To truly be intelligent, it is required that you know things that are so. Not that you just know stuff. Right. All kinds of people know a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. They have given themselves PhDs to celebrate and to applaud all of the stuff right. that they know. They came up with theories. They talked the theories to one another. They now know the theories thoroughly that they came up with. Right. And they call that knowledge and they celebrate it and they applaud it. So the problem is not that they're ignorant. The problem is they know so much that isn't so. so. And if you know stuff that isn't so, you may pr profess yourself to be wise, but you're not intelligent. <laughs> Yahweh said, don't let my instruction depart out of your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. And he said, if you will do that, you will be intelligent. He has told us how to be in the know when it comes to things like, where did we come from? He, he has told us how to be in the know when it comes to, to things like how did everything that is come to be? And how long did it take it to come to be? And who created it? And where did man come from? And what standards should govern the behavior of men? All of these things we can be in the know of if we meditate day and night in Torah. Torah is the answer. Torah is where we're taught these things. So we started on a journey seven weeks ago through the book of instruction that we might know what is so. In Genesis chapter 1 and in Genesis chapter 2, we found out some awesome information. We, we know how everything came to be. We know who created it. We know how long it took him. We know that he ceased from labor on the seventh day, blessed it, sanctified it. We know that he created man in his own image. We know that he created... 
uh, that he created him from the ground and that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We know that he put man in a garden and told him to till it. So that we, therefore we know that work is not a curse. He's always expected uh, man to work. Uh, we know that woman was made from man. We know that man is to leave and cleave. That's what he said in the book of instruction. We know that it's required that everything that is have a name because he gave Adam that responsibility. We know that animals are beneficial but they're not designed to be uh, our companions, nor are they capable of being our companion. <clears throat> it's a, a perversion to elevate them to that level. All of this is good information. Now let's go to chapter 3 and continue in our quest to study the instruction of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh. Because if he wants us to know something, it's because we need to know it. Right. To, to not know it is to be unintelligent. So we want to know it so that we are intelligent. Genesis chapter 3. You there? Yes, sir. Look at verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to cover all of Genesis 3 this morning, but we're going to spend quite a bit of time here on verse 1. The serpent was more subtle. Yahweh's given us some information here that we need to know. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that Yahweh had made. There is a beast more subtle than any that's ever been created. And he is so skilled at what he does, he went into a paradise setting and deceived the man and the woman into a flagrant act of disobedience. Now, that's skilled. The word subtle means cunning. Cunning means to have an instinctive skill at hiding your intent. It is to be skillful at deceiving another one, another person of your purpose. Someone who is cunning can be determined to destroy you and completely hide that from you. They can make you think they're concerned about your well-being when the whole time they're out to annihilate you. To be more subtle then means to be more skillful in deceiving someone about your purpose. So this serpent had a purpose, and that purpose was the death of the man and the woman. But he was cunning enough to hide that from them. The word is also, this word translated subtle, is sometimes translated as crafty. It, it means just that when you see the word crafty. It refers to someone who has developed the craft of deception. Deception is a craft. The serpent is crafty, cunning, more subtle than any beast. But Yahweh doesn't leave us in the dark. He warns us about him and reveals to us how he works. Listen to what we're told again there in verse 1. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Well, did Yahweh say that? He said, Yea, has Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Had Yahweh said that? No. no. That's not all, at all what he said. Let's go back to chapter 2 and read exactly what Yahweh said. Look in verse 15. And Yahweh Elohim took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying... Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. So he did use the word every, but it was to say of every tree you can eat. Yeah. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. So the serpent's quote is a blatantly false quote. Yea, he says... Has Elohim said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? It's not that he doesn't know what Yahweh said. He does. he does. 
So why would he twist it to make it sound so horrible? Let me give you two reasons. Number one, it is the craft of the serpent to speak of Torah as being either uncertain or unreasonable. When he brings up Torah to you, he wants you to think it's either uncertain or it's unreasonable. Do, do you remember it was said here that he was cunning and crafty. When you hear the word crafty, don't think sneaky or cunning. Don't think sneaky. When you hear those words, when you hear the word subtle, cunning, crafty, think skillful. He's very good at what he does. What did he do? He gets people to think of Torah as being unreasonable. If you bring up the law to most people in our day, many times you'll hear them say something like this. Well, you know, nobody can keep the law. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Why, you know, nobody can keep the law. Why are they saying that? Because they've been told that. It's been told to them over and over and over and over until they accept it as true. The serpent has beguiled people, skillfully got people to believe that what, what is written in Torah is unreasonable, that, that there's no way anybody could keep it. But yet, what did Yahweh say when he gave it to them? It's not hard. Keep it. And they heard it and they said, well, that's not hard. We can do that. But the serpent has been at work to convince people, well, it's too hard. That's unreasonable. There's no way anybody could live up to that standard. That's what he does. And people also think that a lot of it's uncertain. You go to talking to them about the Sabbath, and if you back them in a corner about it and they feel threatened about it, they'll, I've heard this over and over and over again. Well, there's no way we can know which day really is the Sabbath anyway. Yeah. It's uncertain, so there's no way to keep it. This deception has come about because that old serpent works on the minds of men to get them to think Torah is uncertain and unreasonable. So, number one, the reason he twisted this so badly is because the words of Yahweh, he, he wants them to sound uncertain and unreasonable. Number two, he twists the words of Yahweh into things that are blatantly false or takes them out of context because... The truth's not in him. Right. We, we saw exactly what Yahweh said. He said, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat. When the serpent brought it up, he said, indeed, or yes, indeed has Yahweh said that you cannot eat of every tree of the garden. So f the first thing he does is wants to make what Yahweh said sound unreasonable. Next, we have to understand that he, he wants us to, to, not that he wants us to understand. The next thing we've got to understand is not only is he trying to make it sound unreasonable, but we've got to understand that when he talks, there is no truth in him when he talks. All right? He could not repeat the truth and try to get her to not believe it. Listen to that. He couldn't repeat the truth in its context and then try to convince her not to believe it. That wouldn't work. He's more skillful than that. You remember, you remember some of you do, the show Happy Days? Remember Fonzie? You ever seen the episodes where he was pushed in a corner and had to say he was wrong? That's it. He could not say I was wrong. He'd say, I would, burr, burr, burr. and he, his body would just shut down. He could not ever admit he was wrong. We live in a day and time now where you can go YouTube bad if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Fonzie, say wrong. You can pull it up. Well, that, that's, multiply that time infinity and you understand this serpent. There's no truth in him. He, he just can't stand to utter the truth, not sure he's capable of it unless he takes it out of context. He did not say to the woman, in other words, pay attention to this. He did not say, did Yahweh tell you that you're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? 
Because he knew Yahweh had said that. That was truth. Right. So he's not going to come at it from, from that pers perspective. He, he can't utter truth. For, for Yahweh's words to come out of his mouth, he has to twist them. He'll either twist what is said or he'll try to make what Yahweh said seem unreasonable. Let's look at a couple of passages in the Gospels that will help us to, to see this nugget of truth. Look in John 8, chapter. John chapter 8, look in verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he's going to talk about this father whom he calls the devil. He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, listen carefully. He was a murderer. What was he trying to do to the man and the woman when he came and talked to them? Kill them. Kill them. Murder them. That's what he's trying to do. He murdered the truth so that he can murder them. Messiah said he abode not in the truth. That is, he refused to continue in truth. At some point, he made that decision. He's not going to continue in truth. Messiah said there's no truth in him. None. Zip. Nada. No truth means that, that, that he can't quote truth and let it stand on its own. He's got to either twist it or take it out of context if he's going to talk about it. He, he, he cannot refer to it unless he's doing that and lying about it. Messiah said he speaks lies because that's who he is. He is a liar. Or we could say it this way, he speaks falsehood because that's who he is. He's the falsifier. <clears throat> Yahweh told us exactly what the serpent said to the woman because it's important for us to know this about our enemy. He wants us to think that Torah is uncertain, unreasonable, and, and Messiah, or excuse me, Yahweh wants us to know that the truth's not in him. So when he's speaking, he's never speaking truth. Look at another passage, Luke chapter 4. Messiah said this about him, the truth's not in him. So look in Luke chapter 4 and let's read this, understanding that. Verse 1, Yeshua being full of the Holy Ghost, being full of Ruach HaKadosh, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If you be the son of Elohim, command this stone that it be made bread. And Yeshua answered him, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of Elohim. He went to the instruction book to get instruction on how to deal with this temptation. Verse 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. If you therefore will worship me, all shall be yours. What did Messiah tell us about him in John chapter 8? He was a liar. You can't tell the truth. Truth's not in him. He's a liar. And the reason he lies is because that's who he is. Then how is it that for decades we have read this passage and we have thought and we've been taught that the devil was telling the, tr the Messiah the truth here? Can't be. He's not telling the truth. He's lying. How do I know he's lying? Because the truth's not in him. Right. When he said, all this power will I give you, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it, he's not telling the truth. All this power does not belong to him. Nothing's been given to him. He doesn't have anything to give away except lies and misery. He has deceived people into believing that he has possession of things that he does not have possession of at all. The earth and the fullness thereof are Yahweh's. When Paul said that Satan is the God of this world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he wasn't saying that he is God over the world. 
He's not God, period. He's not God over anything. Paul used this phrase, God of this world. He was acknowledging that many people have been blinded by him and deceived by him, and they think he is a God when he's not. They're worshiping things that they think are God, and they're not, but they're actually worshiping an old serpent who is not a God. So when this old serpent told Yeshua, all this power will I give you, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I'll give it, he was lying. I know that the word of faith and Pentecostals and other denominations teach that man gave Satan authority in the earth. But that's a doctrine that's based on trying to interpret a lie that Satan told. Nowhere else are we told that it was given to him. The only one who said he has it is him. And he's a liar. Anyway, the only thing that's ever been given to him is a promise he's going to be destroyed. Yes, sir. That's all that's ever been given to him. Look in verse 8. And Yeshua answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and him only shall you serve. Went back to the instruction book. But notice that, Yah, that, that, uh, notice that Yeshua did not say, well, I know it all belongs to you, but I'm going to take it back one day. No. No. Why didn't he say that? Because what the devil was saying was a lie. Right. He rejected the idea that anyone could be deceived into worshiping anybody other than Yahweh. Also notice he put that slithering beast back in place. He said, you shall worship Yahweh, your Elohim, and him only shall you serve. <laughs> He's reminding that beast he's nothing but a created being. Right. Verse 9. Here's the part I really wanted us to read. And he, the serpent, the devil, brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If you be the son of Elohim, cast yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And Yeshua answering him said, answering him, it is said, you shall not tempt Yahweh your Elohim. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. What the devil attempted to do here is precisely the same as what the serpent did in the garden. He wants to make Yahweh... And his instructions seem unreasonable. He said, it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. Well, he's quoting Psalm 91. He's saying to Messiah in Psalm 91, it says that they'll bear you up in their hands and you won't even dash your foot against a stone. He's saying to the Messiah, surely you realize that's unreasonable. You don't believe that. Nobody could believe that. If you do believe it, throw yourself off the top of this pinnacle and see if they catch you. Well, <clears throat> Messiah teaches us something very important here. If there's something written somewhere that we might not yet fully understand, then what are we supposed to do? Go back to the book of instruction and get our instruction from there. If you're looking at Psalm 91, meditating on it, and, and the devil is trying to bring up questions and doubts and concerns, fine. Go back to the instruction book if you need instruction about something to do and get your instruction from there. And Messiah went back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I think it is. He went back to Deuteronomy and he came back and said, it is written or it is said. Who said it? Yahweh. Yahweh said it. It is said, you shall not tempt Yahweh your Elohim. He found his instruction from there. We, we need to move on, but, but not before we understand that the serpent is extremely subtle in his desire to destroy men. He's skillful at getting men to think that Yahweh 
is in some way uh, uncertain or unreasonable. And if he can get men to think that, then men will think they'd be better off if they ignore what Yahweh said. We don't need to be ignorant of the devil's devices. So let's read on. Verse 2. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, You shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now what did she just do to what Yahweh said? And, and what he said about that? Don't, do don't add to and don't diminish. Okay. She added something to it. Yes, she did. Yahweh never said for her not to touch it. Yeah. When we add to it, we work with the serpent to make it seem unreasonable. That's unreasonable. What, what did the Pharisees do with the Sabbath command? They added so many things to it, it was a burden and unreasonable to believe that, that you were supposed to do all those things. I mean, they just added command on top of command on top of command about what you could and couldn't do. You could carry a half an orange, but you couldn't carry a whole orange. You could walk this far, but you couldn't go any further. You could walk this far as long as you had uh, set a place aside where you could refresh yourself. Then you could go on beyond that. It was just one ridiculous rule after another ridiculous rule. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, what Yahweh said seems... Unreasonable. That's the reason the Messiah said, y'all got this all twisted up. Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. What Yahweh gives to us in the Sabbath is a blessing. It's a beautiful thing. It's loaded with benefits. It only becomes unreasonable when men start adding garbage to it. Wow. Verse 4. Serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. There he goes lying. Yep. For Elohim does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. You shall be as Elohim's, knowing good and evil. There he goes lying. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Here's the lesson. When you start listening to your own heart, you're going to transgress. She is not doing what Messiah did. Every time the serpent said something to the Messiah, what did he say? It is written. It is written. It is said. When the serpent talked to her, what did she do? She added things to the scripture that shouldn't have been added. And she went inside her own heart and started listening to what her heart said. That's exactly right. She's pondering it in her heart. And she's, it says here, well, it looked to be good for food. It looked to be good for food. Well, if Yahweh didn't want me to eat it, why does it look like food? She's thinking in her heart. If, if he didn't want me to eat it, why is it edible? The same argument gets used today about forbidden things. Why does it seem so edible if I'm not supposed to eat it? Why does it taste so good? Right? It says here in verse 6, it was pleasant to look at. When she looked at it, it was beautiful to behold. Actually, the word it, pleasant is desirable. It was desirable. It was something to look at and desire. A tree to be desired, and, and there that word translated desired there means to delight in. And she saw that it was a tree to be desired. It was a tree to delight in, not something you ought to shun. It was to be delighted in. In her thinking, it would be unreasonable and wrong to not find delight in it. 
Why? Why did she think it was a tree to be desired? What's the next phrase say? To make, wise. <clears throat> to make one wise. I ought to delight in that because it will make me wise. You want to take a wild guess at what Hebrew word was used here that's translated wise? Would you be surprised to find out it's the exact same word translated as good success in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8? In other words, she looks at this tree, goes pondering in her heart, and she says, you know what, if I eat of that, it'll make me intelligent. She convinced herself that the intelligent thing to do was eat. She convinced herself that the fruit from a forbidden tree is what would give her true intelligence. What tree did she eat of? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here is the deception of mankind. Mankind is deceived into believing that they are more equipped to determine what is good and what is evil for themselves. They do not need somebody else to tell them. That's, that is the deception. And that is what Yahweh is sharing with us in Torah is the deception takes root in a man's heart when he starts thinking, I can determine for myself what's good. And I can determine for myself what's evil. I don't need an instruction book to tell me that. Mm -hmm. and men continue to be deceived by the craftiness of the serpent to believe that they can arrive at the knowledge that they need to decide for themselves and they don't need Yahweh to set those parameters for them. They can know for themselves what they can do and what they cannot do. What they should do, what they should not do. They can know and determine for themselves how to worship. They can know and determine for themselves what they can eat and what they can't eat. They can know and determine for themselves what day they can worship on. They can know and determine for themselves what kind of holidays they want to participate in. They can know and determine for themselves about sexuality and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. It's a great deception taking place when mankind says, we'll determine this for ourselves. We don't need a book to tell us that. Every action and behavior that is a violation of what is written takes place because men continue to believe that their knowledge is of more importance than what Yahweh said. What they think in their heart is truer than what he said. If your doctrine, your worship, your behavior violates or opposes or ignores what is written, the subtle one got to you. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, Adam and Isha, his woman, hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh amongst the trees of the garden. Where did they hide? They hid among the trees that were allowable for them to eat. Yeah. Where do those who reject Torah try to hide? They try to hide in the midst of other scripture. They say, see, we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, so we're safe even though we're not doing that. They hid in the midst of the garden. Verse 9, Yahweh Elohim called unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's your fault and it's her fault. It's not my fault. Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, 
The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. It's his fault. Verse 14, And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, He didn't ask him why he did what he did. He knew why he did what he did. He just said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So I want you to mark verse 15. We're not going to say a whole lot about it today, but in the weeks to come, this verse is going to be very important to our understanding other things that take place. He said, I'm going to put enmity or hostility between your seed and her seed. What seed does a serpent have? Can Satan reproduce himself? I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Read on. <clears throat> Under the woman, he said, well, let, let me go back here. When he says, here's what that seed's going to do. That seed's going to bruise your head. That's very important. Verse 16. Under the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. And sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband. He shall rule over you. Understand that when he says that about your desire shall be to your husband, he shall rule over you. That's not a punishment. It's a protection. He says he'll uh, be a governor over you, a ruler over you. I'm putting him there to protect you. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Said to the man, the ground is cursed because of you. It's cursed because of what you've done. I didn't make it that way. You did. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. If you've ever tried the garden, you understand the curse. Thorns and thistles, it brings forth to you. Whether you want them or not, they're there. And it's amazing to me how each crop you plant has its own type of garbage that comes up around it that for a long time you can't even tell if it's what you planted or if it's something there to destroy what you planted. The curse is real. Verse 19. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return into the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust shall you return. There's the death that Yahweh warned him about. Listen to this. For dust you are. You were made by me from dust. And yet you got deceived into believing that you could decide for yourself what's good and evil. Yeah. That you would know better. You were made from dirt and you decided, you got deceived into believing you could decide for yourself. You did not need your creator to tell you what was good yeah. and what was evil. Whew. He always said, instead of being able to do that, however, you brought death upon yourself. Verse 20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So verse 20 I say, Adam called his wife Eve. I say, no, he did not. Kava. So one of the things we're going to do as we study Torah is we're going to find the real names. And we're going to look at them because every name has meaning. And the meaning presents to us a message that we need. Adam did not call his wife's name Eve. I've not been able to find the origin of that or why it was changed. All I know is it was changed. But it says here that Adam called Isha by name. He called this woman who he had just always referred to as my woman. 
He called her Chava. Does anybody remember what Chava means? Life giver. Life giver. In the midst of, of all that was going on, oh, what an awesome yeah. act by Adam. When everything around them was about to change for the worse. When he could have berated her, even though he did the same thing, he could have berated her for being the instigator of it and said to her, look what you did. I just had a house and home. Look. Instead, he said from this day forward, I'm going to call you the life giver, the giver of life. Why? Because he heard Yahweh talk about that seed. And he said, you, I'll call the life giver. That is a beautiful moment uh, here in the life of this man and this woman. Adam is choosing to look ahead and not behind. That's good. His wife would be a life giver, so he focused on that. Verse 21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did Yahweh Elohim make coats of skins and clothed them. What animal did he kill? And that's what, isn't that what we're told? He killed an animal, yeah. made them garments? Hmm, that's not what it says. But, but we've been made to believe that there had to be blood shed, so he killed an animal. That's not what it says. It, it, it says he made coats of skins. Doesn't say he made coats out of skins. It said he made coats of skins. Keep your finger there and go to Exodus 22 for just a moment. Exodus 22 is talking about putting things up for collateral, loans, things of that nature. Listen to what it says there in verse 26. Exodus 22, verse 26. If you at all take your neighbor's raiment to pledge as collateral, you shall deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he cries unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. The garment that he was to return was raiment, it says here, for his skin. Same word translated skin in Genesis 3. Yahweh made for them coverings of skin. Now, I, I don't know what their bodies were like before they disobeyed. But when they disobeyed, it changed. It changed so much that they became very aware of their self in a way that they weren't aware of their self before. What they are now covered with... <clears throat> is not what they were covered with before. What they are now covered with is mortal and temporary. He made coverings for them of skin. He didn't cover their skin. He made coverings of skin for them. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about that Every different kind has its own flesh. And he talks about how we have our own flesh. But it's not the same kind of covering we'll have at the resurrection. He said it will change at the resurrection. That, that this mortal will perish and that we'll put on a new type of covering. So... I, I don't understand all I know about that. All I know is that, <clears throat> that it's quite a stretch to say he killed an animal and made them a, a jacket out of it. Here's your new leather coat. 
What it tells us is he made coverings of skin. Uh, that's the reason Yahweh says to us, meditate in it day and night. You don't always get it just by a first reading. Verse 22. Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. There's so much there that needs to be meditated upon. I mean, there is a lot there in verse 22 that needs to be meditated on. But let me simply point out today, uh, for time's sake, that men still make the same stupid mistake they made there in, in uh, Genesis 3 when they could have chosen life and instead they chose knowledge. When they could have chosen... The, it must, Yahweh said the tree of life is right there. But rather than choosing that, they chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They choose to have this knowledge so it puts them in charge over having obedience that gives them life. Yeah. And men are still making that mistake. Right. Rather than choosing obedience that leads to life, they're saying, no, I want to be in charge of determining what's right for me and what's not right. right. I don't want somebody else telling me what's good and what's evil. I'll decide that for myself. Yahweh revealed this to us, this, this issue, so perfectly in sharing this story with us in Genesis 3. Verse 23, Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. <clears throat> in Genesis 3, Yahweh wanted us to know how evil came into the earth. It was not by him. It was brought into the earth by man choosing to believe someone besides him. Well, yes, he, he believed someone beside him, but that serpent's very subtle. Well, yeah, he is very subtle. But the only way his skill works is if you choose to reject what Yahweh says. Yes, he's very subtle. But we are not ignorant of his devices and we're not in the dark. Yahweh gave us instruction. And the subtlety of the devil, the craftiness and skillfulness of the devil only works if you choose to believe what he's saying over what is written. Right. Yahweh laid that out for us in Genesis 3, and it still applies throughout all of mankind. Right. It's still the same issue. Are you going to believe your own heart and what the serpent is telling you, or are you going to believe what is written? That's the information we need. Yes, sir. Stand to your feet. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.